Well, again, this morning, it's good to be here. I know that, uh, that Greg and Kim are probably coming back from the Springs this morning, a little while after they went yesterday to uh, support Greg Jr. in a half marathon that he ran yesterday. Um, and, you know, I, uh, it, so when he asked me to come back and speak, of course, I never passed up the opportunity to get to be, to be back home here at Calvary, so it was great to be here today. You know, as, and some of you that know, that know me, you know that I that I enjoy I enjoy sports I enjoy sports of all kinds. Um, I I enjoy playing golf. I I grew up playing soccer and playing basketball, and I played a lot of softball and stuff over the years. And 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 as a as a youth pastor for a lot of years, and I, I've gone to watch a lot of uh, students do events and a lot of sporting events. And I've watched every sporting event that you can imagine out there. And 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 I have I have never. Uh, liked to run, all right? I mean, I like basketball because I can sprint, right? I like soccer because it's short sprints or playing softball because I can hit it and run to a spot, right? I don't have to just run long distance and, and I've never been a long distance runner. In fact, um, when I was, all the years that I've been watching kids do sports, one of the sports I had to force myself to go watch kids do was the cross country races, okay? Uh, because, you know, you, you get to see these kids take off and then they go, right? You don't see them forever until they come back, right? I mean, that's it. In fact, I've been to some races at Confluence, and, you know, you, you see them take off. And you can maybe see them when they come up over a hill somewhere and they come back. And, and it's always crazy because um, back when I was doing junior high ministry in Texas, they would make every kid that was going to play football run cross-country for, for their training, right, to get in shape, more or less. And, and this is West Texas, and it's hot, and there's these football linemen and stuff out there running and it's it was it was sad because you would see these guys they would take off and and whether it's a two mile or three mile whatever the race was and they would race and when you see them coming back across some of these poor kids they were coming across and they were just I mean they were beat red or they were crying or they were throwing up or whatever right I mean it was just sad and and so one of the many things I never enjoyed doing was that was running right but I do love I do love missions, and I love getting to be part of ministries that are a part of missions. In fact, for years and years, I've gone in, into Juarez, Mexico, on spring break and built homes. I'm going again this next spring break. Uh, in January, I'm going to the Dominican Republic, and we're doing some youth rallies um, there in the, in the DR and some area that our church is a part of. And I, love, I just love missions and everything to do with missions. Well, a few months ago, there was a young lady that represented a, a mission um, called Team World Vision. Now, World Vision is, is a ministry that's been doing the sponsor, the kids' sponsorships for a lot of years, where, well, Team World Vision is a part of that. And, and she came and had a meeting with me to share with me her, her ministry. Um, and her ministry was, um, was raising uh, money to get drinkable water in Africa. And, and so at this, this meeting that we had, um, she, she shared her, her vision, her testimony, her ministry, and, and she she showed me statistics, you know, of what drinkable water can mean. She showed me videos of what it can mean to a, to a villages. She showed me pictures. And, and she convinced me that I could make a difference if I was to raise money running a half marathon, okay? That's what she convinced me of. And she played on my missions, my missions weakness, and, and she convinced me that I could do this. Now, the longest I can ever remember running was about maybe two and a half miles growing up. This was 13.1 miles, right? Uh, and and if actually, she tried to convince me to do the marathon, and I said, no, all right? I said, but I will, I will try to, I, I'll do the half marathon. And, and so I took this on, and, and I took it to the church. We've got two campuses there, and I went to the church, and we made a big presentation, and we had about 30 people show interest in running this half marathon with us to try to raise money. And, to, to, for, you know, and every dollar goes to this much water. I mean, she, we had the whole, the whole deal. And so um, we did this. And for, and for months, I decided to, to, to run and tr to train to do this half marathon. And I, and I raised finances and I raised people donated and it was awesome. And, and because I've never ran a, a marathon before of any kind and, and because, you know, I, am, I, I just crossed the age of 50 and I figured, well, you know what, this is going to be hard enough. So let's just add it, make it even harder. I'm going to push Seth in his wheelchair, right? Because my son Seth, who's sitting here this morning, um, you know, he's got some special needs and stuff. And we decided, I, I'm going to push Seth in his wheelchair. I played the Seth card because I figured, if I'm going to run a half marathon and I tell people, hey, would you support me running a half marathon? They're going to say, well, but if I say I'm pushing Seth in his wheelchair, well, right? I mean, and so, and it worked. And I raised, I doubled my goal, right? Seth and I, Seth and I doubled our goal. Um, 
and it was, it was good. But, but the week before the race, the race was on Labor Day. In fact, I ran the same, the same um, the race that, that Greg Jr. ran yesterday. I ran the same path that he ran yesterday in his half marathon. But the week before the race, Karen had set up an appointment for me to have a physical now, I hadn't had a physical in probably 10 years, at least, right? I just don't, haven't been to a doctor in forever. Um, so I figured, okay, it's about time. My birthday was on Wednesday. I was going to turn 51. It was Monday. I figured, okay, might as well get my, get my physical. So I went in for my physical. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm filling out the paperwork that I have to fill out. And I started getting this pain in my side, okay? <laughs> so I fill it out. I'm thinking, okay. So I turn all my stuff in. I go back in the back, and the, and the, the nurse comes in and says, and by now the pain's got a little bit worse. She says, so you're here for your physical, right? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, well, so is there anything else going on today? And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, you know, I got this pain, and I'd already given my sample. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And so I'd already given that, and so I, saw, I was in pain. So the doctor comes in a few minutes later, and she says, okay, so uh, she's, the nurse says that you're in some pain. I said, yeah, I am. She said, well, I noticed that there was some blood in your sample. And she said, and by now the pain has gone from, from a one or a two to about a five or a six, you know. And I've got pretty high tolerance for pain, I feel like. But she said, you know what? I think you might have a kidney stone. Now, how many of you have ever had a kidney stone? Anybody? How horrible is that, right? Um, it is worse than childbirth. Thank you. I would never say that to anybody who's had children, but thank you from the mom who's had children and a kidney stone. And so I'm in, I'm in pain. So she says, well, I, since I can see you're in, a, you're in a lot of discomfort, I will at least bypass your, your prostate exam. I said, well, thank you very much, okay? <laughs> and, and so I, I go back, have to give my blood still, and she set me up with an appointment right then to go get a CAT scan later that afternoon. And she set me up with some pain pills and stuff because I was, by this time, I was in a lot of pain. And so, so I get in my car and I, I drive to Walgreens to get my, my pain medicine. So I walk in and, and I am hurting. I mean, I'm at seven or eight for sure now. And I walk in, I stand in line for a second, I give my re- prescription to the pharmacist and they say, it's going to be about 30 minutes. And I'm thinking, oh. okay, well, I can't go anywhere because I've got to wait for this, this pain pills. And so I go out to my suburban and I'm going to lay down and wait. Well, I lay down and I can't, there's just, there's just no way. So I'm, I'm standing outside my suburban, I'm leaning on the car <laughs> and I am, man, I am breathing heavy and I am, I mean, I am walking and I am dying and, and, and there's a guy that walks by and there's some, there's some local homeless people live in that area. And this is the homeless guy I come by and said, he was so worried about me. He wanted to help me out with something, right? He said, <laughs> sir, can I help you? And I was like, man, I, he said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay, but that's why I'm here, right? So I, so I stopped, I went in and got my medicine, took a pill as soon as I could. I get home, lay down. I still have about an hour and a half before my, my CAT scan. So I go, I lay down and I've taken the pill and there's an hour later, man, I, I am still, I'm not sure how quick these are supposed to work. I don't take pills, but it wasn't working, right? And so I took another one, okay? Well, these are not good to be taking and then driving, which is what I did next, right? And so I drive to the CAT scan I get, my, I get my CAT scan and I find out that I have one that's lodged up high and I have a couple more behind it that are smaller. And, and guys, I'm a week away from supposed to be running a half marathon, okay? Well, the doctor says, because I, I told him all was going on, I had, a, I had a neurologist appointment the next morning. So I go home and for hours I'm just, I'm in pain and then it just stops. And I figure, okay, so maybe I pass this and I don't even know, right? Because I've never done this before. And, and or whatever the case was, and I, and I, and I was fine the rest of the evening. I wake up. I'm feeling okay. I go to the neuro to the, to the not to the neurologist. I go to the to the urinologist, and I go and and he uh, he does he, he talks to me. We talk about it, and he says, "Okay, you, you've not passed it because it's a five millimeter, which isn't huge, but he says you know if you pass the stone." Okay, <laughs> I said, "Okay," and so, but I'm feeling pretty good, and he says, "But he knows I'm gonna run this race." He says, "Okay, well we'll we'll set up a." a, a surgery for two days after the race that way you can try to run you can run the race and and then if it hasn't passed by then we'll see what happens well I wake up the next morning on my birthday and it is worse than on the day I was at the doctor's office it was bad and and Karen leaves me and goes to school like I'm not even I mean no I'm just kidding but it was it was I was in pain and I was in pain all day I finally I texted her later said we I gotta have this I gotta get the surgery I mean I gotta do this and so so I get an emergency surgery on Thursday day after my by birthday, I have this emergency surgery in the morning, and I want to run this race on Monday, okay? So I have this surgery on Thursday. I can't back out of the race. People have already given money, right, to this, this organization and stuff, and, and so I, I have the surgery. They put in a stent 
which you don't even need to know about the stent, okay? But they put in a stent, and he puts it in, and I'm going to tell you this because I love you. He puts it in so that, so that I, because I want to run Monday, he puts it in and enables it so that I can take it out myself so I can run the race because I can't run the race with the stent in because there's, it's very uncomfortable, the stent. Jason, it's no fun, okay? And, and it, was, it was bad, and so Sunday afternoon, I pull out my stent. I won't tell, you don't need to hear that story. I pull the stent out. And then I get it the next morning to run this race. Now, I've had surgery a few days earlier. I've had these kidney stones. I've had a stent I pulled out. And I, but I got to run this race, right? So I got a picture. Uh, I got a picture of, of Seth and I before the race that morning. Um, and so if we can, we'll see if we can get this up there. I, I made Adam figure this out. But that's not it. <laughs> I am not that pretty, either one of those guys. Um, but so we get up there. And the race is, we have to be there by 6 in the morning. Okay, on Labor Day, and so Seth and I get up, and we go, and so there we are, right? And it's cool out that morning. I am, and guys, I can still barely bend over to tie my shoe at the time, okay? But I'm about to run this race. Now, I've trained for this. I've ran miles and miles and miles. I've not trained a whole lot pushing the wheelchair um, or Seth in it, which changes the race completely when you have to push 100 and some odd pounds in a wheelchair, and I find out later. And so I run this race, and we run it, Okay. And so we run this race, and it's not bad, and, and it's, it's horrible. It's not, it's, it's horrible. It's not, it's just not bad. I will never run a marathon again. Okay, so here, but here's the deal. So leave it right here for a second. At the end of the race, this is three and a half hours later, okay? Guys, I, I didn't realize some of the things. You push in a wheelchair, there's a lot of things that happen. First of all, you can't move your arms, right? So my shoulders are killing me. Didn't realize that. I got a shin splint about eight miles in, and I've never had a shin splint in my life, and it was horrible. And, and so I'm doing this, and I'm dying. I finally crossed the finish line. And, and I am wore out. I, I got a close-up. Go closer. I'm wore out, but look at Seth. Man, he is leaned back. His legs are crossed. He was like, all right, let's do this again, Dad. I mean, and, and he had a blast the whole time. He was clapping the whole time. People were giving him high fives the whole time. He was ta- it, was, it was awesome, and it was horrible at the same time, okay? But guys, through this, I had a lot of encounters with people. I mean, I, encountered, I had encounters with my doctor, I had encounters with a, a, a urinologist, a surgeon, nurses in the hospital. Um, I met people while I was running all the time. I met all these amazing people doing ministry um, with drinkable water in Africa. And, and we got to have a lot of encounters that have all changed my life and will continue to change my life, right? I mean, uh, I, I find out that the guy who was doing my surgery, that his wife works in the Iwana program we've got at our church. I mean, just a lot of different things that God just kind of worked out through all this. He had a lot of amazing encounters with people through this whole thing and I'm not unique we all have encounters we all had encounters that have got us to where we are today made us who we are today formed us into who we are today molded us in who we are today and are still molding us as to who we're going to be in the future right and this morning we're going to look at an encounter with Christ out of scripture out of John chapter 4 we're going to look at an encounter with Christ that changed a lady's life changed it completely. Someone who was feeling, who, who was facing a, a life full of disappointments, a life full of loneliness, a life full of bitterness, of struggles. But in the midst of her life, she came face to face with Jesus, and that encounter changed everything for her. We're going to learn about this woman that, that Jesus met journeying through Samaria and how this encounter changed her life. So we're going to go to John chapter 4. Um, and, and we're going to go back and forth to this chapter, so you can leave it here for a while. But let me just read some verses again um, of John chapter 4, just to kind of bring us back to where we are for this story. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he says, He left Judah, and he went back once more to Galilee. Now here's the important part. He says, Now he had to go through Samaria... So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had already gone into town to buy food. Now, before we go any further with this, I want us to consider, uh, I think, a couple of interesting facts that right away we see in this story. First one, and you have this in your notes, in your, in your, in your bulletin as well, is this, is this right here. This was not the normal way, okay? Guys, this was, this was not the normal way. First of all, guys, in this time period, Jews and Samaritans did not get along, right? They didn't get along. Samaritans were, were a mixed breed, so to speak. They had mixed origin. They had some Jew, yes, and they had some mainly Assyrian, 
right? That's primarily what their origin was. They, they, and, and to the Jewish people, they were not only half-breeds, but according to the Jews, they did not practice pure Judaism, right, at all, but a mixture of Judaism among other religions. And because of this, the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, right? They looked down on them. They didn't get along. In fact, the Jews would, would normally go around Samaria to get to Galilee from Jerusalem and back. They would go around. In fact, not normally. They always went around Samaria. They wouldn't go through Samaria for any reason. Not because it, it wasn't the most direct route, because it would have been a lot more direct to go through, the, through Samaria, but, but they didn't want to do that because it kept them from becoming contaminated by the Samaritans. So they thought. But in our text today, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Well, guys, he didn't have to go through Samaria on the road to get from Jerusalem to Galilee. That's not what he had to do. But there's some other reason. This was not the normal way to go. Scripture tells us, though, that he had to go through. So he had to have had another reason to go through Samaria, other than it only being the, the only way to get there, because it wasn't the only way to get there. And I believe that he had to go through, through Samaria because there was someone who really needed to have an encounter with him on that day. He had to meet her where she was. So because of that, he had to go through Samaria. So that wasn't the normal way. Second, it, it, it's, it's not the normal time. Now, another interesting thing we learn in this section is that this woman is coming to get water, it says about the sixth hour, about noon. Okay? And this would be at the very height of the sun, in the Israeli desert area. This is, this, is a, this is the hottest part of the day. This is not the normal time that women would go to the well to get water. No, they would get up early in the morning when it was cooler, and then they would go to the well and take care of the business, get the water and bring it back. So why was this woman getting water at this time of the day? Well, well I want us to get a glimpse of what may be going on with this woman in her life at this time what she may have been feeling and experiencing in her life at this time, and consider some of the customs and manners of this time. So, I mean, think about it. The story begins with this. Imagine for a moment that, that this woman, she, she's in her room at her house. She's at her house. She, she picks up her clay jar. that She, has to, she gets water in every day. And she, she opens the front door, and, and the heat of the day hits her in the face. And for a second, she's probably taken aback because of the heat. And then she peeks her head out, looks up and down the street, and notices that there's, there's nobody there. It's, it's hot, it's, it, it, but it's also quiet. Because it's not the best time of the day to be outside, fetching water or anything else, for that matter. She could have gone earlier in the day, when it was cooler, but for her to have done that would have meant that she had to face the other women in town. And she certainly didn't want to do that. That's why she's going out now. Now at this hot and uncomfortable hour, because she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to face the other women from town. She doesn't want to face the other women at the well. Because she's really, in essence, she's the town bad girl. I mean, she's sleeping with a guy that's not her husband. She's been married five times to other guys, and none of them have worked out. Those relationships all failed. She didn't have much to hope for in her life, not much hope of her life getting any better. She's hoped for a better life before. That's why she's got married five different times, and each time they've failed. She's back in the same place every time, divorced and miserable and looking for something else because she's bitter. She's given up on marriage. She's she's pretty much given up on really living. She's lonely and she felt hopeless. She was basically just existing from day to day. That's it. She was just existing. She's not really living. In fact, she's living a shadow of a life, not a real life, not real living, just a shadow of a life. If we take a second before we go on and and talk about the hopelessness that she may have been feeling at this time, um, and probably the hopelessness that maybe at one time or another we've even felt where life had gotten overwhelming, and we weren't really quite sure where to go next, and life was tough, and choices were tough, and things weren't working out quite the way we wanted to, right? Maybe you've been there. I think I've felt that way myself at times. And here's a key truth. Guys, living life without hope is only a shadow of a life. Right? If you don't have any hope in life, all you can live is a shadow of a life. And we are surrounded by people in our lives every day that don't have God in their life. And guess what? They don't have hope in their life. They're just living a shadow of a life. In fact, in 1 Chronicles 29, 15, this is what King David said. He said, we are foreigners 
and strangers in your sight, talking to God, as, we, as were all of our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Right? I mean, our shadows exist, right? We all know we've got them. I can see shadows in here right now, right? Shadows exist, but they don't really live. They just exist. And are we living life like a shadow? David says, you could be living life like a shadow where you, you, you're living, but you're not really, you're, you're, you're existing. You're not really living because you're living without hope. Maybe you go, you've gone day to day and, and, and you do what you need to do. You, you try not to dwell on the bad choices you may have made in the past. You know, why didn't I do this? Or why did I do this? Or why didn't, and we, and we try to forget all that and just kind of forget it and move forward, right? And, and, and maybe we think that that's, that's the way to live. Just instead of asking why all the time, let's just forget about all that and let's just move forward it, because the past is too painful. We, we just don't think about it anymore. We'll just move forward. And that's, that's easy to say. But the sad part is that even though you may want to move forward and you try to move forward, you also don't think much about the future. You're trying to ignore the past, but you, wanna, you don't want to think about the future either because then it's scary, right? Because then you're, you're afraid that what if I make these plans and it doesn't work out, then I'm going to be depressed and upset again. And, and so instead you just exist. You get up for another day, you go to work for another day, you do another load of laundry, you go to school for another day. You make another sales call. You don't think about the past. You don't think about the future. You just want to get through the day. That's how this, that's how this woman's living. She doesn't want to think about the past. She sure doesn't want to plan for the future. So she's living without hope. She's living a shadow of a life. But then enters someone who was, number three, not the normal man. She's had some experience with men in her life. None of it good. Now she heads out of town on this hot middle of the day to go get her water and as she nears the well, she notices that there's someone there. It, it, it's a man, and not just any man, it's a Jew. What well, kind of confuses her for a second, because, well, first of all, she thinks, well, at least it's just, it's a man and it's a Jew. It means I don't have to talk to him, because he, he sure won't talk to me, right? Because that's not what the culture says or does. So he's not going to speak to me at all, because he's a man first, and because I'm a Samaritan and he's a Jew. Now, and nobody really talks to her anyway. People may talk at her, right? They may call her names, they may talk about her, but nobody really talks to her anyway, because her sins and her lifestyle have kind of made her that outcast. But as she's having this thought, this thought she, she's jarred back to reality by the man asking her for a drink. And he asks in a very pleasant way. He's very kind to her. And this is not normal for her. She's thinking, what, what's going on here? Who is this guy? And for a second, maybe she even begins to hope a little bit. Well, maybe, maybe I can have a, a, a normal conversation with somebody. Or maybe I can even have a different life. Or maybe I can have a hope for a future. Maybe she starts hoping and then she probably stops herself pretty quickly and says, well, don't hope because to hope just means to be disappointed. And who is this guy anyway? Who is this man anyway? She thinks, does he really need to be reminded of this situation? Then we get to this, this number four, not the normal conversation. She knows what she's expecting for a conversation, but this is not the normal man. You go back to John chapter 4, and let's jump to verse, verse uh, 9. And it says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Right? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water? She thinks, What's this man talking about? What's he talking about? So verse 11, she says, Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Verse 13, Jesus says, he answers, Everyone who drinks this water, they're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, he says, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life life eternal life she's never heard that phrase before she's thinking i would just like to have any kind of life let alone an eternal life what's this water he's talking about i would love not to come to this well anymore and have to come in the middle of the day and avoid everybody to get water i wouldn't have to risk people seeing me there and maybe hope begins to surface again verse 15 she says the woman said to him sir give me this water so i don't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water he told her go call your husband and come back Okay, so all that hope she just had, boom. She gets smacked in her face again with the reality of this is her life. She didn't have a husband. 
She's got five that she's had in the past. She's living with a guy now. Her life is a mess, and she knows it. But there's no need to tell this guy about it, right? There's no need for this man to know my life's a mess. So she just tells part of the truth. In verse 17, she says, Well, I have no husband, she replied. And this is where Jesus really got her attention because he said to her, you're right when you say you, don't, you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands and the man you, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Can you imagine her thinking, who is this guy again, right? How does he know this about me? Moments ago, she was beginning to hope. Now the pain of her life, though, has just kind of, has just kind of smacked her in the face again. Don't hope, she says. It's too scary to hope. And so here, here's the thing, another key truth. So you see, while living life without hope is only a shadow, right, of living, the next key truth is this, living life, sometimes living life with hope can be scary, right? Even when you have hope, life can sometimes be scary. And it, became, it, it becomes scary because if we hope and we're wrong, then we can be disappointed. And, and I realize in this room, so many of us have been disappointed in life before. We've been disappointed by people, We've been disappointed by circumstances, by jobs, by ourselves at times, right? And nobody likes to be disappointed. So to avoid disappointment, sometimes we avoid hope. And and we think it's going to be better just to not hope at all. We think it'll make life a little bit easier to live if we just don't hope for anything and then get disappointed. But as we live a hopeless life, again, we don't really live. We only exist. Go back to being that shadow again. So the woman thinks to herself, okay, he's just told me stuff about me that there's no way he could have known. So we got to change the subject and get to something else, right? So verse 19, she says, sir, the woman said, hey, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So Jesus joins along this conversation with her. He says, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We as Jews worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Right? He's talking about himself. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seek. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, here's where we get to the stuff that she really, she, she's had some education, right? She says in verse 25, the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. She's trying, remember, she's trying to get him off the subject of her. Let's talk about religion, right? Let's talk about the spiritual stuff. You're a prophet. Let's talk about religion. So she's going even further. Hey, I know there's this, this Messiah is coming. He's called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus blows her mind, right? Verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples show up. They return and and were surprised to find Jesus talking to a woman, but they've been around him long enough that no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? And then it says in verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the whole reason she came out there in the first place, the woman went back to her town and began to talk to her people. She said to her people some things, right? She was blown away. She said, not only does this guy know everything about me, now he's just told me that he is the Messiah. He's the one we've been waiting for. So she rushes back to town. And I think so many thoughts are probably rushing through her mind. She thinks, could this really be the Messiah? I mean, he didn't know everything about me, and I've never met him, right? And her, her, her blood is, is rushing through him, and her heart is beating really quick. She's excited. She's feeling alive. I mean, if this is the Messiah, if this is really God in man form, then God was willing to speak to her. She's never had that thought before. Someone who, who made the choices she had made, who'd lived the life she had lived, and God was willing to talk to her, does this mean that there was hope again? Hope for someone even like her? And, and was she even willing to step into that kind of hope? This did not seem to be the hope that she's had in the past. This wasn't anything like she had experienced before. This was a hope that would change her. Hope was coming alive to her, right? Now, while living without hope, she had, she had, as she had done for all these years, just existing, now she saw that there was a chance to really live. And this we get to the next key truth in your notes. That, that living life with hope is really living, right? Living life with hope is what real living is all about. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans 5.5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This, this lady, this woman, 
was starting to really live because she believed that this man that she just met, this Jesus, was actually the Messiah, the Christ, the one who was God and is the Savior. And she wanted this encounter to change her life, not just her life, but everybody's life around her, right? I mean, guys, we understand that this is not just any kind of hope that now she is involved in her life. It's not, this, it's not just any hope. It's not just hope that leads, it's not just, the, and here's the thing, understand that it's not just hope that leads to real living. What we hope in is what matters, right? Not just having hope, but what we hope in is what really matters. When we hope in the wrong things, we do get disappointed. When, when we have our hope in others, guess what? They're going to probably let us down sometimes. When we have our hope in circumstances, they're going to fail us. But when, our, when we put our hope in the living God who loved us and sent his son to die for us, to save us from our sins, we will never be disappointed. We're, we're in, we can truly start to live. In fact, Jesus tells us in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, real life, now and for all eternity. Well, and the story continues. The, the woman makes it back to town. And she's excited, so excited that she's no longer worried about what people are thinking about her. She's no longer worried about talking to other people. She begins to share with everybody what's just happened to her. She's had this encounter and it's changed her life. It, it, it's encouraged her to move into this real hope. And while she's have a, she has a past with five different husbands, her future's still uncertain. Right now she's living, for the first time in her life, she's living with real hope in Christ. And she believes that this is Messiah, so she believes she should share this. And so we jump to verse 29 here in John 4. It says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Now, again, realize she's the bad girl of town. We, we know she's had five husbands. She's sleeping with a guy. There's no telling whatever else she's done in her life. So when she comes into town and says, hey, come see a guy who told me everything I've ever done, there's a lot of people in that town that are thinking, oh, no, right? That could involve me, right? And so they all want to go out and see what exactly this guy's all about. So they all run out to say, okay, let's see this guy that knows everything that she's ever done, right? And then they spend some time with God, with Jesus Christ, and everything changes, right? Guys, he, he knew her past. He knew her present, and he, and he still spoke to her anyway. Man, there's so many times that I, that I think about this. How can God love me and forgive me and give his life for me? Because he does know my past. He knows everything I've done. He knows what I'm living right now. And yet he still loves me so much he wants a relationship with me. See, there's, there is hope no matter what our pasts in this room are. There is hope for all of us. No matter what's going on in your life right now, there is hope for all of us. God wants you to have an encounter with him. And because of this woman, others had an encounter with Christ. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Now, look, I I realize that most of us in this room, we've had that that, that initial encounter with God. We've encountered him. We've accepted him into our lives. We've had that encounter. And if, you've, if you're in this room and you've not done that, you've not had that encounter, I want to encourage you that this morning to take care of that, right? To take care of that, to, to come and, and, and to, to bring yourself to Christ and, and ask him to come into your life and have that encounter that can change your life because, guys, God wants to have that with you. No matter what you've done, I guarantee you none of our lives in here look as messy as this lady's life did at the time she met Jesus. And yet he did everything he could to go out of his way to go have an encounter with her. I encourage you today to make that decision. But all of us, if you've, made, if, you've, if you've accepted Christ into your life, how many of you are allowing that encounter to change your daily life, to change the encounters that you're having? You know, in, in my, all my prep work and everything for that, for that marathon, I got to meet and talk to a lot of people about why I was doing this, right? When I got to share with, that, with those doctors and nurses, right, this is why I still want to run. Not just because... I'm trying to prove a point. No, I've raised money to help this mission. I got to talk about Jesus and about what this mission looked like. When I got to run in our town, I got to have conversations with people I saw every day about why I was doing what I was doing. And and it it was a great opportunity to share my encounter with Christ with others so hopefully they could have an encounter with Christ. 
How many of us are doing that every day? Are we allowing that encounter with Christ to change the lives around us? Or are we just kind of just living our life, getting through life, moving through life? Do we need to be reminded of the hope that we were given in our relationship with Jesus Christ? With that encounter, do you have that hope in your life? Not just for what you've gone through in the past, what you're going through right now and what you're going to go through in the future. We can have these things. This is, he is not the normal man. This was not the normal experience that the Samaritan woman had, and yet he wants to have that exact same encounter with us. Let me pray for us this morning. You bow your head and close your eyes for a second.